for episode 16 of Inside the Rookery. I'm Lindsay Law, RPG writer and editor and host of Inside the Rookery. From the Rooks, I have beneath me, as always, cartographer and designer Andy Law, former <laughs> producer of Warhammer 4th edition, and Mark Gibbons, artist and designer who was instrumental in many of the most iconic Warhammer images. And we are delighted to be welcoming the living legend that is Andy Hall, BAFTA nominated writer, narrative designer, who's currently the lead writer of Total War. And we are here today to talk about adapting Warhammer. Welcome to the stream, Rooks, and welcome to the stream, Andy. It's great to have you back. Thank you very much. I, I wish I was a BAFTA nominated writer, but it's a BAFTA nominated game that I just happen yeah. to write for. Uh, <laughs> splitting hairs there, Andy. <laughs> here. Here. Take the credit. Yes. <laughs> As a collective, you have been BAFTA nominated. Like, Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. We're very excited. I got my invite yesterday, actually, so I will be getting the talks and going. Nice. Andy Hall, legend for Seagull, absolutely. Um, <laughs> welcome to the show. Um, so we have, as always, had loads of questions pre-submitted by patrons in our Discord community. I'll be bringing them up on the screen. There's loads of people watching already. So if you've got any questions or comments, chuck them in the comments section, whatever platform you're on, and I will bring them up on the stream and we will get to them. It is entirely Andy's discretion whether he answers any of them, but you are welcome to ask anything you like. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, let us jump into the pre-submitted questions. A stalwart of our pre-submitted questions, Kilashandra asks, as part of Warhammer adaptation, I assume there's also an element of originality involved. How much leeway are you granted for new creations? Um, we've granted uh, a surprising amount, actually. Uh, I mean, if you think we've been in development since 2014 and we've done some crazy, crazy stuff, actually. Um, you know, uh, we pretty much created the Vampire Coast from a from a small white dwarf article. Uh, we brought in Salastra Dyfin, uh, who's like a, an original character. Um, and I suppose uh, the, the most interesting one is actually the advisor. Who, he, he's kind of our key character that has been there since the start. And he, he came about really because um, we needed to have an advisor for, for all the different factions, because um, that's the way Total War works, but uh, they didn't give me a budget um, <laughs> for four different <laughs> ways. So, because the obvious one, isn't it? You know, you've got the Orc faction, you, you want you want a little goblin whispering in your ear, going, hey, boss, do this, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, I could only have uh, uh, one faction's worth of advisor for four. So what we did is we, we kind of lent into that um and, and and made him a diegetic character rather than just someone that sits in a portal uh, and kind of made him interact with the characters um uh it, it directly uh and, and from that we started to kind of um kind of bring about a, a story so so why why is you know why are the yorks listening to this weird blind old man um why are why is Archeon listening to this guy <laughs> uh, so so what could have been a weakness and i'm sure some people thought it was a little bit crap um we, we kind of just lent into it and, and kind of spun a very warhammer tale um and it made him a bit more of a spectator for warhammer 2 and then really kind of brought him to the fore in warhammer 3 to kind of finish off uh, and make it like a stealth prequel I'll uh, add a small part as well because I've done quite a few adaptions of Warhammer uh, in me career and I've found in general the Games Workshop is an absolutely marvellous partner. They are as excited and as interested in the setting as anybody else out there and when it comes to creating something new they obviously have a very keen eye and they're very interested to see what you're going to do and they'll have a comment if it is for example something they don't think is quite right but in general they're a partner they're not just sitting there saying yes no um or any other uh, similar antic so to speak they're very much there to try and help you build the very best products you possibly can and they're as excited and as interested in that as anybody else Absolutely. The licensing team, um, you know, I've been working with since, well, since, well, I used to be in licensing, so I, I know those guys. And um, yeah, yeah, exactly that. There, there's no kind of gatekeeping. It's like, what do you want to do? Here's a suggestion. 
oh, well, that's not quite like right. Have you thought about going in this direction? Mm-hmm. And, and I think through that, we, we managed to get ourselves a, a trilogy of really good games. And did your time in licensing yourself help you navigate it now you're on the other side? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Uh, I'm certainly kind of poacher turned, well, no, gatekeeper turned poacher. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I used to be the one to go, no, no, no. Uh, and now it allowed me a bit of insight to, to, to know what we could get away with and stuff. And I'm, I'm sure that's why CA found a bit of value in me. Uh, hence why I. Uh, got the job and uh, mm-hmm. stayed there. I was only going to do it a couple of years, but... Is <laughs> that something that gets you? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm coming up for 10 years with them now. So, wow. wow. Yeah. And I moved south. Yeah. I used to be, live in Nottingham. Yeah. yeah. That's where Games Workshop is, but they dra- managed to drag me south, even with the house prices. So, yeah. Yes. Yeah, going well. Excellent. So um, the Bloomage 2 in the chat has popped in a question. So the Great Orthodoxy is a new creation to Total War, Warhammer's depiction of Kislev. What motivated you to step away from the more wild, wandering nature of priests and religion depicted in Realm of the Ice Queen? Um, That was uh, very much kind of um, a a games workshop, kind of wanted to do a fresh new Kislev and, and we we kind of came up together we, we like the idea of having kind of you know this kind of uber religion kind of controlling faction kind of thing a bit a bit like the magisterium in the uh, in the golden compass stuff uh and and, and we, we kind of like that it's superly dark and warhammery that again uh, the 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 people you would think are good are actually just controlling um so we kind of went that way um but, you know, the, the stuff in Bloomage's question um, about the wild and wondering nature, you know, that hasn't gone away. It's just we didn't focus on that uh, to start with. Um, that there's certainly an aspect of Kislev we, we will be revisiting. Um, now, as one of the people who wrote that book, I obviously have an opinion. Right. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, um, and interestingly, Steve D, one of the other authors, he's coming on next week. Um, so uh, that might be worth, if anyone's got any questions as to some of the creation for Realm of the Ice Queen, pointing out too. Um, I, I found the new additions that are super fascinating and super exciting. One of the things I often hear down through the years as people who are creating for Warhammer things is, oh, it's got updated, it's got changed. Doesn't that annoy you? And no. Um, it's a constantly evolving setting that is being used and reused for different purposes. And whilst um, there are some writers who really drill down hard and try to make everything work together seamlessly, there are others who are adding crazy cool on top of everything too. And Games Workshop stand there at the back going, yep, that works, that works, that works, that works. And it was a super exciting addition I found. I was um, very pleased with that book come out. But to go back to the Realm of the Ice Queen is one last point. There was a lot of new in that to um, ha- hark back to the first question. Um, it had to synthesize everything that come from Graham McNeil's novels, for example, as uh, he did his Ambassador Chronicles. Yeah, Gav Thorpe it. added a whole bunch of extra gods um, when he wrote his articles about Kislev for the Warhammer game. Um, then there was a bunch of other books, often with slightly different versions of a Kislev that we had to look back to, right back to the very first edition of the game. So it's a constantly evolving setting. New bits are being added all the time. And then having someone come along and add yet more on top was Mm-hmm. Awesome. But I can, you can cake. see, if, like, if you think of Graham McNeil's Ambassador Chronicles, and we've had Graham on, so check on the on YouTube for that episode because we did talk a lot about the Ambassador Chronicles. You can kind of see in those chronicles that sort of totalitarian religious, you know, like the secret police. You can see how that would have developed into a great mm. orthodoxy. It's not, it, it's not like really radical for kids left to do that it doesn't make sense in the way that they're depicted across various media throughout yeah. you know kids left's history we will scour you know when we're bringing all that stuff in into total world we will you know one of our pillars and i'll say this a lot probably a lot today is uh, authenticity pillar and we will scour any kind of existing material including realm of the ice cream and in fact the the song i think you probably wrote no that was um, dv that was Steve yeah. D. Yeah, he wrote Steve that one. <laughs> uh, and that became the theme yeah, of Warhammer cool. 3. It was in the trailer. We got, um, or Sega got a rock band to actually perform it. <laughs> um, so, yeah, 
is, is, is pebbles is pebbles dropped in the pond with, with games workshop you never you're never quite sure whether whether ripples will go i mean my my arguably most significant contribution to, to warhammer is the is um no not not to vegas marathi <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's it's actually inclusion of squig hoppers because back in uh, when fourth edition uh, yeah. fantasy was being worked on the orcs and goblins book i was i was sketching out all the um all the goblins and the, and the, and the squig uh, 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 partners. Um, and the, the notion of squig hopper was, was put forward. And Rick Priestley was, 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 was not convinced. He thought they were a little bit too silly, a little bit too wacky. And I managed to persuade him. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> I managed to persuade him, no, we really should have them. And I drew the picture. He went, yeah, all right, let's put them in. And here we are now, years later, you know, it's the, the, the kind of staple of the York and Goblin army. So. Oh, sorry, um, uh, um, gloom spike gits. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah. working in an established IP, especially one, you, you, you can't get too egocentric because you're always standing on the shoulders of giants. Oh, yeah, yeah, for um, sure. You know, 100%. And that um, that speaks to this question that Sir Reason has popped in as Cafe is a completely new faction, even for Games Workshop. Have you had the possibility to influence the creation of the faction race itself, or is it more that you adapt the given facts by GW to Total War's needs? It's a bit of both, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, I, I literally wrote some building descriptions for Cafe uh, this week. So, and, and that stuff, they just let us rip. Um, uh, but uh, obviously, they, they focus more in on the troop types and stuff. Um, but yeah, the Cafe's kind of um, uh, invention was, was certainly a. a, a uh, organic one um and an interesting one i probably can't say too much um, <laughs> interesting but, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah but we, we you know we, we talked to workshop we we certainly fed our ideas um we had some learnings um uh because we uh, not my team personally but we uh, creative assembly had launched three kingdoms um mm -hmm. Uh, just a couple of years before, so we certainly had some learnings uh, about so what kind of Chinese and the Eastern audience likes and doesn't like, and and we had some ideas of our own, and we kind of fed that in to to workshop. But it, it was, you know, a workshop as I've probably said before, um, not here that they created a effectively a a cafe army book for us, uh, and then we did what we've kind of always done. And we take those army books and and we then adapt it to Total War, uh, and, and we bring in new and original stuff as and when we need it to service the game, not frivolously. Never, again, talking about that ego thing. It's never about mm -hmm. ego or you know this is my corner of the Warhammer universe. It's like does this serve the game? Do these kind of loading screen quotes serve the game? And 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 bring in that kind of. Dora Jar feeling that uh, Thomas Purin always talks about with Warhammer background. It's about uh, creating Dora Jar moments. So you 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 write something, but you leave the door. I'm pointing to my door. You can't see it, but, <laughs> <laughs> but you leave the door slightly ajar. So that allows the player, um, whether he's a tabletop player or whatever, to kind of start filling in details himself. Uh, uh, and you know that, that's why a lot of these other areas of of, of the Warhammer world map kind of started they were just like door ajar moments on the warhammer map and, and then you know 20 25 years 30 years later they turn into full-blown um armies for for big triple a games <laughs> so acre biker asks and i would love to know the answer to this too um how likely is the <laughs> development of nippon in total war warhammer 3 uh don't hold your breath uh, I, I, I have said this before, you know, uh, Cafe was almost like this unique situation. We had experience with the Eastern audience. Uh, we needed some good guys for all the demons we were facing. Um, so it was like a confluence of scenarios that allowed us to kind of generate this, or, or, you know, allowed the Games Workshop to generate this, this brand new side of, of Warhammer. Um, it, it's, it's not as simple as... Can we do this race now? Can we do that race now? Ringing them up. Um, um, so, future new races. As, as I've said before, I'm on record saying it. Um, you know, don't hold your breath. We've got a massive roadmap for Warhammer 3. You know, we're, we're still at the beginning of that roadmap as well. 
um, but our brand new races on it, no. not at the moment. So, so Long Shadow Games asks a slightly different question. It's not race or um, Warhammer countries. It's now that Cathay has had some of what's the next big area of the Warhammer world to get some attention. Well, I, I think we're still going to, you know, Cafe, um, just like it's kind of earth counterpart is a massive space it's a massive area you know and we just touched the bit yeah. near the great bastion and a little bit um on the west leading into the mountains and more that there is so much more of cafe to, to kind of look at if, if you're looking for new areas to expand um but you know we're, we're also looking at all the other races you know we're well aware some some of the, the races that have been released earlier very early yeah it means some love too and stuff so well yeah. off topic question are you playing ghost of tsushima in the background no no that that's just the um the immortal empire's um end plate wallpaper so sorry to disappoint you there but it's, just, <laughs> uh, it's just blooming a bit on this camera for some reason yeah. So here's an interesting question. I am very fond of Beastmen. We'll come to a question about Blood Bowl, but my Blood Bowl team were a, a chaos team um, and, and I loved them very dearly. Um, the Beastmen were a sort of forgotten faction, yet they are currently have some of the best mechanics. What are some of the challenges of adapting a faction famous for the lack of organization and hatred for civilization into the campaign aspect for the game? They are my favorite race, as you can tell by my name, Goat Scream, <laughs> and also your picture, Goat <laughs> <laughs> well you, you kind of work on the themes and and that allows you to kind of start generating those those kind of interesting paradigms uh, uh, and faction mechanics so um you know it, it was an empire building game so actually isn't it cool we have a race that does the opposite that burns down empires mm -hmm. you know that's the theme certainly the breaking of civilization uh, runs right through the the beastman army book um so so we certainly wanted to try and contain that um and, and you know obviously um on the tabletop there's lots of ambushing and stuff like that so so again we, we kind of try and adapt uh and and bring the total war version of, of that race to the fore uh it's been a while since we did the beastman um but yeah it it, it was certainly certainly looking at you know burning down civilization and how, how you reward players to do that uh, to make it cool and interesting not not you know just a bit dull um jotan art says not a question but can i say thank you for doing such a wonderful job with the whole setting i've been playing warhammer heavily since 1993 and i love y'all's take on the old world sorry to gush never be sorry <laughs> <laughs> gush please <laughs> But, uh, you know, like I said earlier, we're all standing on the shoulders of giants, you know, Rick Priestley, Jervis, Andy mm -hmm. Chambers, you know, those were my childhood heroes, uh, and even Mark as well. I, even I, Mark? Yeah! yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was, you know, I was at school looking at Mark's someone's artwork, sorry to age you a bit. There, that was mate. unnecessary, that was unnecessary. <laughs> I was the same. same, yeah, me, yeah, me too, it, it was, it was, it was certainly, it was, um, uh, I mean, I, I came from a gaming background. That's that's what I wanted to do. That's where I wanted to work. I was playing D and D as a teen and um, and collecting miniatures. So for me, I, my hero has been John Blanche and Jess Goodwin, and obviously yeah. the writers as well. But it's kind of like, yeah, it's it's we're all very cognizant of who's who's come before, you know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yep. I love talking to John. He's he's like um, you know, he's a happy grandpa with loads of cool stories. Um, about how things come around, and you know, mm -hmm. uh, the one that he, he told me when I was interviewing once is like they, um, him and Jez Goodwin just went to the pub, uh, one afternoon, the trip to Jerusalem, and then basically invented all the first founding space marine chapters in the pub. Um, oh, oh, these are the blood angels, and they should look like this. I was like, oh, I wish I was a fly on the wall, yeah, <laughs> at that point. And they just came back with a couple of sketches and they went. Rick, this is what we think Space Marine chapters should be. And and from there, you know, a multi-million pound business. Yeah, yeah, crazy. 
Yeah. Weren't you, you were just saying yesterday to us, Andy Law, that you had had some feedback. Was it from John Blanche on something you did for Warhammer 40k? And you just couldn't believe that you were getting like critique on your yeah, work was, from John yeah. Blanche. And like it was, yeah. it was mixed. It was good. And there were some things to improve. Well, and, what it, it, the, the point I made from that one was one of the things I like most about it was that, uh, his commentary was really good um he knew exactly what um he wanted changed and why and he explained it quite clearly and i was like yes 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 unlike some art direction i've had back where i've gone really i mean is that what you i mean if that's what you want sure i was like oh no that all makes sense and at the end of it he had um, a lovely little this is absolutely excellent this is all it needs and i was like john blanche said my stuff was excellent i'm done I'm yeah. over. <laughs> yeah, he's, him, him, and the rest of those sort of old guard are so steeped in it. In, in, you know, they, they bleed Warhammer blood, the blood of the old world and the new. You know, it's uh, yeah. It, it, any piece of advice from from the likes of John is is is, is gold. Yeah, it, and it's brilliant. Talk to him about his influences, like like uh, German Renaissance, like, like Drew, uh, uh, and you know, so he's proper kind of steeped, not just in fantasy art, but proper. You know, oh, yeah. history and heart legitimacy. Um, yeah. Sorry, it's, oh, I was no. Say, it's no. It's no surprise that, that people like uh, Rick and then Nigel Stillman, are, are, you know, came from an acad academic, often sort of archaeological or historical background. So they bring yes. all that, all that real world knowledge to bear. I think it makes a big difference. Does. It really does. It, it set the kind of the the the, the foundations of Warhammer. You know, taking these real world kind of history and like you say with the academic backgrounds and then just turning it slightly on its head uh to create something that's slightly british and and eccentric <laughs> <laughs> so we've got a few more total war questions um so uh, compared to other new factions of warhammer 3 kisley and could they have a roster that's far more limited can we expect some new units soon for our lovely kislev and kathy um, and, and also a comment, add more goblins to Total War, Warhammer, you cowards. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I can't, obviously can't give any specifics, uh, but I think that's a fair assumption to make, um, you know, that we'll be looking at Cafe and Kislev in the future uh, and, and kind of carrying on fleshing out those cool new factions with some crazy cool, cool shit. Here's one um, from Mr. Vorn. So you've shown with the likes of Death, Mar Death, De can't say that, Death Ma Master, Snitch, and others a willingness to convert loner-like characters that are not known for commanding armies into legendary lords. Where future characters are concerned, have you more embraced the popular concept of legendary heroes, or does your focus still rest with predominantly legendary lords where the technical capability allows? Well, that's a deep question. Um... I know. I'm like, this is a bit beyond. Uh, yeah, we, we, I think we have done some legendary heroes now, and 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 yeah, they prove quite popular. Um, so we will certainly continue with that category. Uh, but but with legendary lords, they're kind of your, they're your avatar uh, in this world. Uh, they're meant to kind of be your your role playing as them. So it makes sense to try and bring as many as those warham celebrities into that role as possible even if you know like deathmaster snips they're typically not generals they're low they're loners but again the you know we're, we're following in the footsteps of the tabletop they, they do that as well you know um deathmaster snips um you use him i think he can lead armies on the tabletop maybe i'm wrong there i'm sure someone uh watching would correct me um uh, and, and so but the point remains that you know we, we want as many of those warhammer celebrities those legendary lords to represent you on the tabletop where the, the heroes are more kind of your lieutenants but where it does make sense to have a named hero um we, we've certainly gone down that route later in the development um, so I mentioned we would come back to um, Blood Bowl. MCB asked, <laughs> Andy Hall, I know that name. Isn't he the Blood Bowl guy? I haven't touched that game in a while. While, What do you feel is the best way to play Blood Bowl these days? Any fond memories of it? Yeah, I've got, yes, I am the Blood Bowl guy. <laughs> <laughs> I was, oh, yeah, you're going to age me. Yeah, back in the early 2000s, I was head of Blood Bowl, uh, working under Jervis 
he was obviously the creator of Blood Bowl. Uh, and, and, and kind of looking after that, and I was editor, editor of Blood Bowl magazine, uh, and, and then later Fanatic magazine, looking after Blood Bowl, uh, bringing in new teams uh, like the Ogres. Um, uh, yeah, and I've got lots of fun memories uh, of Blood Bowl. I, 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 I kind of, well, I'm a founding member of NAF, which is still going strong, which is uh, basically the, uh, well, if Blood Bowl ever had a professional body, uh, the NAF would be it. <laughs> um, and, and so, yeah, there was five of us to start with, and now it's a massive, it's quite a big organized, global organization that organizes these tournaments. Uh, all over the world, sometimes with cash prizes. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's, it, it's great that it's just continued to grow. And obviously, um, the, the, the computer games, uh, I wrote Blood Bowl 2. Um, so, so that was fun, uh, kind of voicing uh, Jim and Bob, well, writing the lines for Jim and Bob. I'm not a voice actor. Um, and, yeah, the, the, and that's going strong. What? Well, Blood Bowl 3 has just, uh, just come out. Um, I haven't played it yet myself. I've got to Neither play. have I. Keep on meaning to. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, I, um, I, I, I love Blood Bowl. Um, I, the latest edition has a new passing stat, which I, I'm, I don't know about. I, I've always <laughs> been... <laughs> Always been about you know this, the glory of Blood Bowl third and ed- fourth edition and Jervis one of Jervis's masterpieces is that simplicity of the simplicity mm-hmm. right. four stats does it all mm-hmm. uh, and and you know those passing skills um, so I'm not sure why we needed a passing stat uh, passing skill um, what I think I know is to bring passing more into the game and making it less of a crapshoot but I don't know I remain skeptical if I'm honest. 100% behind that particular line of thought, if I do say so myself. Um, the, the great benefit of the second edition of Blood Bowl was just how it started to stream and then it streamlined heavy on third. And it was four stats, clean, lovely. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, really nice. And we've designed. played a lot of Blood Bowl over the years. We, we often come back to similar teams. Andy often plays Human, his Middenheim Wolves, Siggy Surefoot, Star Player. Um, his children are probably <laughs> playing Blood Bowl by now. He's been around for so long. And I always play a Slaneshi Beastman Chaos team. And, and they've all got like really filthy names like Rock <laughs> and Smut Longhorn and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and then they're in a particularly garish colour scheme. What was it? And Andy helped me convert. Pink, my- it was pink, blue. yellow, and a really bright blue. Yeah, ridiculous. Pink, yellow, and turquoise. Like, kind of like this turquoise, actually. I love those. Yeah, yeah. yeah I've got my Blood Bowl team there, you know. Also I've got my, mine over there. <laughs> yeah. Mine are, mine are all still in boxes on the sprue, I'm, I'm ashamed to say. Yeah, yeah no, mine Andy, are painted, Andy which is rare for me. Converted, um, when one of my characters in, in Wifrip went to the Light College, Andy came up with the idea that like the Light College and all the colleges were kind of like like college, real colleges, like universities. And so they all had like varsity teams. So my team was on the varsity Blood Bowl team. So she was a runner. Um, but he converted like a little dog with like a cute little hat to be our team mascot. <laughs> Rumble was his name. And the cheerleaders, it was just, it was amazing. Um, Good times. Wow. So, yeah. That became that Very actually got fun. added back into Warhammer because um that became Midden Bowl, um uh, yeah. which is part of the fourth edition's version of uh, the setting, um, which took the very old, very first edition version of Snotball, um, which was a sport up in Middenheim, and effectively made it a bit more organised and a bit more spread out, and made it a bit of a, a bit of a thing in Warhammer. So they had Midden Bowl, um, and that spread out uh, across from Middenland, and that was a good fun little uh, aside. Midden Bowl is books. also in Vermintide. Is it? There you go. I'm yeah. delighted to oh. hear that. <laughs> 101 Colonel says the Chaos Beastmen would eat the Dwarf teams, and indeed it did on repeated <laughs> <laughs> And Andy Leask, the other rook who is not here, could not beat my team. Just I've got, saying. I've got a fun Blood Bowl fact. Um, oh, mm-hmm. Guess, guess which. Did you know? Most, yeah, it, it is a did you know. <laughs> did you know? <laughs> what was the most expensive component in Blood Bowl 2nd Edition? That's the one that the yeah. Most expensive thing with all the with all the toy soldiers in and the the, 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 plas- the, the plastic little range ruler no. thing, plastic range ruler things. Was it those? You know the little. No, the, the the no I, I'll tell you, Alex, uh, Alex will be here forever. It was the 
uh, metallic spot varnish on the logo on top of the box. So, really? Yeah, the box lid is more expensive <laughs> than anything inside the box. Normally, um, that's one of the cheapest bits. Brilliant. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Yeah, that, I, I did not know that. Good fact. Well, not many people do. Yeah, wow. that was uh, 1980s printing technology for you. Yeah, yeah. Um, but also, why did they do that? <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> yeah. Quick, quick, quick question, Goat Scream. Do each of the colleges of magic have their own Blood Bowl teams? I don't think so. Just the ones that. Operate, yeah, well, Dungeon like... Bowl. Dungeon, dungeon Bowl. Yeah, dungeon, yeah Bowl. dungeon Bowl. Yeah, true. Um, it's, it's where I stole the idea from. Um, I just yeah. tried to make Dungeon Bowl potentially fit into Warhammer. Um, in a way that felt like it was authentic to the setting, because obviously you can't just port Blood Bowl over. That's just not going to work. But yeah, yeah. So, Dungeon Bowl. So, let's hope what that... The on that was... Sorry, Andy. Um, no, no, you go, Andy. ...was that the Blood Bowl world is, is slightly to the side of the Warhammer world. Uh, you know, it's a satire version. Yeah. Like the day-to-day is a satire version of the news. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Or the news uh, is a satire yeah. version of the news. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a dark, twisted alley. We don't want to go down to. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah. So the, the Blood Bowl world is kind of slightly parallel to to, to the Warhammer world. Because I, I get asked that question a lot. Oh, in the in the Warhammer world, why is everyone stopping playing Blood Bowl? The answer is because it, it's not the same world. They've got television in Blood Bowl. Yeah, good old couple. Cabal Vision. Yeah. yeah, Cabal Vision. It's a different Cabal world. Vision. Cabal Vision High Density HD. <laughs> yeah, we're, we, we're not going to talk about news, but um, if I make another Blood Bowl team, it's going to have a particularly legendary character called, I don't know, Garius Lineker or something like that, I would suggest. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. Um, so let's have a look. Here's um, a few, loads more questions coming in the chat. So I will step up the pace. Hellforger asks, any plans for new mechanics for older lords like Balthazar Gelt and Teclis? Love what you did with Volkmar to make him really unique. Cool. Uh, well, well, I was a while back now. In fact, I think he was the very first DLC. Right when the DLC team was like two of us, uh, and it was the <laughs> DLC team now was like you know at least twenty. So, so that's how how big this and how long this journey's been. Um, yes, uh, as and when uh, we get to to looking at those new characters, that I dare say they will get. Um, new mechanics and refreshed mechanics. I, again, I can't be specific um, because you know we have announced plans, uh, and this podcast isn't sadly one of them. Um, but yes, uh, the, the, certainly the principle will be <laughs> when we get to those characters for a refresh, we'll look at their mechanics and update as required. Um, um, Baster34 asked, when something as Cathay or End Koresh or whatever else had little lore in entire decades get made, do you think some fans make unrealistic expectations because they had mythologized them too much? Is it a worry you deal with as uh, creators or do you ignore it? Okay, or somewhere I, I, in I between? Yeah, I don't think there's any harm in letting play, people get excited and mythologize about what's, what's going on uh, and, and what their take would be. I think um, uh, one of the big things we don't do, and as we know, is we don't look at fan dexes and fan army lists and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, not because I don't think they're cool, uh, because we don't want to be compromised uh, and you know open ourselves up to you know legitimacy issues uh, mm -hmm. and author issues. Uh, same reason Terry Pratchett never read any uh, any fan fan work of the Discworld. You know he. He wouldn't do that because if he then wrote a book about <laughs> that fan could maybe claim that that was his idea. Um, yeah. So, so uh, no, I, I think it's cool that people talk and get excited about Warhammer and have their own takes. Um, but it's not something we as, as kind of creators slash adapters uh, can participate in um, uh, for, for the reasons I've kind of said. It's pretty obvious, really, isn't it? 
Um, here is quite a, a long question. So from Toka Gaming, Total War of Warhammer has been an amazing ride. Got in despite not having any interest in fantasy Warhammer. Um, got awestruck by Thorgrim's beard. <laughs> now I just want more and more DLC, FLC, anything and everything to make the game bigger and better. So how can we, as players and consumers, help bring attention to the game so it gets well-deserved time and resources, bug fixes, polishes, support? Some bugs are so ancient they can join the Chaos Pantheon. <laughs> Gatebug says hi. Um, <laughs> hi. <laughs> um, leave us a nice review on Steam or wherever you purchased it. Uh, you know, good Steam reviews help 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 the game. Um, uh, you know, and tell your friends. I, I suppose it's it's as simple as that, really. Um, and yeah, yeah, the the game's success is to tie is tied to people playing it. Um, certainly. Um, mm -hmm. let's not be naive about that. Um, so yeah, more people that play it, the longer we'll be about, and um, you know, helps me pay for the mortgage, which as the I've said, London, the London mortgage, mortgage. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's not to be sniffed at a London mortgage. Um, so Yuan Juan Johan. Not sure how to say that. Yuan Paquette, with the incoming arrival of the Chaos Dwarves in version 3.0, will some of the older factions be getting some rework or addition to their unit roster to bring them on par with the great game three factions? Uh, I, I think there are some patch stuff that's happening. Um, but yeah, I think all the focus um, will certainly have been on the, the new content for mm -hmm. patch free and and a forthcoming DLC, which um, may or may not be cast off. <laughs> oh, is that is that not that's not a um, okay? I just heard the rumours and assumed. <laughs> we may have teased, uh, yeah. <clears throat> and, and yes, there are. Um, yeah, we have a small amount of races to bring to uh, to bring. Uh, so I'd say it's a good guess. <laughs> Say them and, all. And, and the question's followed up by, if so, how much creative freedom do you have on bringing some of the older forgotten units to the game, like the Dwarven Thunder Barge, for example? Oh, uh, we, we do have that freedom. If if we want to, you know, look at those more esoteric units or Forge World units or even, you know, stuff that's in a, an old uh, RPG supplement, uh, it, you know, if it's there, we'll... we'll and we need it to, to kind of flesh out a roster. We'll we'll bloody take it, <laughs> you know. Uh, we 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 will not just scrape the bottom the barrel. We will go through the base uh, onto the cobbled cellar floor below <laughs> 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 to get what we need to 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 get a really cool uh, and powerful faction. Um, um, but you know, luckily, I'm pretty much unique, probably in all IPs in the world. Uh, you know. Well, maybe some of the RPG IPs like D and D, but you know, Warhammer has that breadth to be able to kind of take that and and allow us to kind of just keep going and and, and creating these you know crazier and crazier units and uh, and rosters. And um, so Jotun R asks, whose idea was it to bring in Brian Blessed to voice Gotrek, and why are they not now enshrined as the greatest Imperial saint? <laughs> Well, um, Brian had previously voiced Gotrek in the book. Uh, in the book, so mm -hmm. so that is certainly not my decision. Uh, I, I mean, I'm all for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, yeah, and because he had previously worked with CA on a on a Total War game, we kind of had we knew his agent and stuff. So you know, there was a match made in heaven there. Um, and yeah, yeah, he came and and gave a uh, his usual performance, <laughs> <laughs> uh, which was you know loud and brash and perfect for for Go, -Trek. Go Treks alive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think my earliest memories of Brian Blessed would either be Flash Gordon, obviously, or mm -hmm. he played Long John Silver in like a yeah. tea time adaption of Treasure Island. He did. And I was a a young, I seem to remember him from that as well. But yeah, yeah so it was great to meet him. And um, yeah, we had Richard Armitage um, for 
obviously for Bellacore, that was great as well. Oh, um, Bellacore. Yeah. Uh, oh, no, I can't say. Oh, I was going to say who we originally are for the Cafe Dragons, but I can't say. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, well. Yeah. Os- no, Oscar nominated. So. <laughs> yes. I'm not saying. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <deal>. so. <laughs> Um, full metal cornflakes. The last Lord pack we got was a bit unorthodox. Is there a particular reason why the formula changed? And is it possible that we're going to see more types of DLC we haven't seen before? Yes. Excellent. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay, I, mean, good. I think it's fair to say Warhammer 3 is a new game and we're looking at the way we do things. Um, and it's all it's all for the better and it'll be cool and stuff. So Again, I can't say too much because I don't, I don't want to uh, at this stage. But yes, um, things probably won't be the same as it was. But don't worry, it's it's cool. Here's a uh, this is an interesting one. I'm M. Wolfus. I'm interested in what I'm interested in is Warhammer Fantasy before the old ones. We know dragons were there, the Nehekar and gods like Petra and Fishmen. There was an <laughs> insect race of some kind and more beasties. Naga too? Question mark. Um, I don't know to be honest whether the Naga predated um, the, the old, old ones. Yeah. Uh, certainly, you're right about the dragons. They they were there. It was pretty much a dragon world uh, until the old ones, you know, interfered and pushed it close to the sun and cooled the planet. So um, warmed the planet rather, uh, and and sent a lot of the dragons to to sleep. So I think it's a fair say to say kind of creatures of reptilian in nature were probably more prosperous or more about when the planet was cooler. I, I, certainly if I were writing that, that's probably the way I would go. Yeah, I, I wrote the bit about this in Fantasy Roleplay and uh, the, the general line that I got was loosely exactly what has just been said there because I wrote about the silver ships sort of first arriving um, and how they moved the world and how they created the perfect harmony of the spheres. Um, with all the other planets that are inside the Warhammer fancy role play, as it was for me, um, a solar system. And yeah, that was fun. It was a good thing to write up. It was uh, written by Finrear, Finrear, um, the, in the Book of Days, the High Elf. Good times. Um, okay, so Godzilla asks for animals. <laughs> How excited are you for the next DLC release? Very, very excited. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it. And <laughs> um, um, Sir Uncle Dunk, that is a cool name. Um, out of all the factions, who are the biggest trouble getting from the tabletop to the game? I feel like it must be the orcs because they're just, you know, just unruly their characters. Oh, just unruly. <laughs> yeah, they're yeah, boss. What are you doing to me? <laughs> it's, it's interesting because you, you can talk about adapting the mechanics of the rules to the thing, or it could be, you know, talking about probably the more the aesthetics. And, and stuff and each, each race has prevented challenges because you're going from a purely aesthetic kind of format you know uh, a tabletop uh, the, the miniatures they're still uh, and they're made to look cool but as soon as and you know mark will know this from working at riot and many video games you know uh, as soon as you add locomotion to those cool aesthetics uh you start getting into trouble. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, <we're> <laughs> uh, um, you know, something that Jez or, you know, or, or, or Brian um, have, has created to make it look like the coolest miniature possible. You know, as soon as they start moving their arms, uh, oh, shit, you know, that shoulder pad isn't meant to go there or that spike, <laughs> it would... Oh, it, have yeah. Off. <laughs> Dead! <laughs> that way. Um, I, I, and also... <laughs> Kind of for, for myself, um, which was kind of obviously artists and animators, that's kind of where they're, they're thinking. But uh, when I'm like casting actors uh, and, and stuff, is what, what actually do they sound like? So I think Lizard Men was quite a tasking because it's like, how do we verbalize the Lizard Men? Because um, they're so kind of alien to a lot of the other races. So, so should they speak English? Should they, should they speak like Dorian, which is kind of the way we went, and then had kind of like uh, the slam talking English directly into people's heads. 
Uh, so that was an interesting challenge. Uh, but yeah, I'm sure you guys have got some thoughts on this as well. Yeah, with what you said about uh, um, look, adding locomotion, you know, every time I see space marines moving, walking, it's space marines are great, legs akimbo on a, on a rock or with a foot <laughs> up on a skull. Yeah. Yeah. As soon as you try and get them walking in those flared uh, 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 lower leg armor, those greaves, it, it's just it's tricky. It's it's tricky to get them looking and not looking a little bit daft. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think some games have been more successful than others. Uh, I mean, I looked at Space Marine. Space uh, Marine. Which, to be fair, really nailed it. But I, I was in the licensing department when we were doing that game uh, with Relic. And, and we it took a lot of iteration to get there. Yeah. And, uh, not just, like you say, the locomotion, um, but also the weight. Uh, uh, you know, these guys are meant to be, you know, not far off half a tonne. Yeah, uh, uh, and, and and so they had to kind of you know each foot had to land and it felt massive and impressive, but they also still had to be ultra kind of a you know agile and stuff. Yeah. Uh, so, but I I think they really nailed it with Space Marines. So I'm looking forward. I to agree. Too. Me uh, too. I don't know mm. anything about it, uh, but I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah, I think they did nail it. This isn't a really nice comment from Jotin Art. This is the best Q and A stream I have ever been in. Excellent. <laughs> I'm I'm the host, so what can I say? It must be all down to me. No, I'm I'm a professional mini painter. Would it be rude to offer to paint each of the panelists a mini as a thanks? So cute. I just moved to the UK from the states, and I would love to start my work off here with such a cool project. Aww. I actually read this as I would love to paint each of the panelists as a mini. <laughs> <laughs> but why? Why would you want to do that? Yeah. <laughs> Captain Andy of the Ultramarines. Um, oh, sorry, of oh, the Ultramarines. You've got to get the correct yeah. pronunciation when you're dealing with Space Marine because he had a very unique way of saying Ultramarines. That's a, a very generous offer. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, Wait, yeah, leave, leave your details. I, I assume you mean for free. <laughs> Good work. Andy's got a London mortgage. He can't be paying for these many. Yeah, I've, got, I've, got a, I've got a California mortgage as well. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that one probably beats it. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Canius Lanius? Canius Lanius? Who knows? I see I'm 30 minutes late into the party. Oh, well, out of curiosity, just how relevant is the old world and cubicles? Sevens were for books to introducing new contents to um, Total War War. I mean, um, I've, I've got the book, <laughs> so I will look at it and read it. And if there's anything there, uh, <laughs> I, I will, uh, I, I will, like I said, use and abuse it uh, as and when. Um, I've, I've said this before several times in different interviews. Our standard is Warhammer Eight Edition, uh, yeah. and then from there we'll go down to lower editions, probably seventh. Uh, and, and and kind of ancillary products like Tamakan and Forge World. Why have I said Tamakan? Ah. Uh, oh, um, <laughs> which, which will go lower and lower, lower and lower down to quite disparity. I don't mean it, uh, but we will go deeper, deeper and deeper, yeah, deeper, deeper into the, the thing. And and you know, Kugel Seven's work is really good. Uh, I know one of the writers, Dave, um, I used to work with him because uh, he, he's at the workshop as well. Yes. Um, and um, yeah, so um, and, and we worked with them as well. They we did like a, they wrote us like a really cool um, kind of role playing adventure uh, that kind of fed into into um, the Warhammer Free story uh, around this time last year. Actually, they did like a launch stream. Uh, oh, they haven't done any more, which is a shame. But um, so yeah, so we worked with those guys in the past. I'm assuming that there may be an answer to this question that Bingletron is looking for. Who was your favourite lead designer to work with on Total War Warhammer? <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, if you mean the guys at CA, my, my colleagues, I, I work with them all um, and, and they're all great. And they're all marvellous. It's <laughs> yeah, the only yeah. correct answer. <laughs> <They're> all... <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Or, or seriously, everyone that's worked on Warhammer has been great. You know, they've been really passionate, and and that's why we've got such a great product. So it's all good. Sorry, not so, controversial there. Yeah, Hellforger says <laughs> absolutely amazing that Warhammer Three we finally got simultaneous multiplayer co-op campaigns with up to eight players. But sadly, currently it's really difficult to play them with four plus players as. Diff- 
diplomacy lags for everyone. Are there plans to improve that? Um, if it's listed in the bugs, uh, then there will be plans to sort it. Um, yeah, um, my, my kind of boss, uh, Ian, he really pushed for that. And uh, that was pretty much it. We start day. I want simultaneous multiplayer campaigns. Um, and, and we got them. And, and they are, honestly, I'm going to sound really obviously biased and a bit trite, but it's some of the best kind of multi-level computer game i've had having having like my friends who i've grown up with um play warhammer um on the tabletop and we can't always be together now we're all fat middle-aged men uh with families and stuff so <sighs> so you know having the fact that we can you know get together on tuesday nights and uh and play warhammer uh still uh is is really good actually um so, so, and that simultaneous really, really works with it. Um, but um, four plus players, diplomacy is starting to slow. I will make a note of that and talk to Rich Aldridge on Monday. Thank you. Wow, there you go. Um, okay, we've got so many questions. Big Talk says, any progress making Apophis as a Tomb King's legendary lord? A while ago, you said you really want him, but his model was too complex. Is he a character we could see in the future with the progress you've made with animation? Um, if I'm being honest, that was probably the last time I thought about Apophis. <laughs> <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> when I answered that question, um, yeah, we have we have some swarm tech now with the nerdlings. So so yeah, why not? Um, nothing, nothing um, uh, uh, steady at the moment. Sorry, I'm getting Teams messages from my colleagues saying, "Why haven't you said I'm your best?" Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, brilliant! Quite right too. Oh I mean, dear, no, that'll teach you. That'll teach you. Not picking favourites. Like, when I saw this with the winky face, I'm fairly certain Bingletron is one of your lead designers. I'm probably like, your lead designer. Probably. Be. Yeah, they must be. Yeah. Right? I bet that's you, Sean, isn't it? <laughs> Cat amongst the pigeons. <laughs> Um, oh, Jotun Art says yes for free, and it would be an honor in a previous comment. But it says, whom could I send my info on the Discord? So Ping I could me. just send I'll it to it Andy, right. Andy Law. He'll sort it all Thank right. you so much, Jotun Art. It's so sweet. Wow, thank, thank you. you. So, so <laughs> you don't Fanger... have to. Honestly, you don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't have to. Um, Soulfanger says, I'm loving Total War Warhammer and I've been playing it since early 2019. And out of all the things, I can't believe Cathay made it in. But I'm curious, there are certainly more Dragon Brothers governing the provinces, but do they work together? Do they acknowledge each other's usefulness or would they wage war on one another for power or is there anything keeping them in check? Oh, good question. Uh, well, <laughs> the Dragon Emperor and Empress are keeping them in check. Um, and they certainly... You know, they certainly acknowledge each other and they certainly have their own rivalries. Just, you know, I, like, like I said before, they're siblings. So it's just like, yeah. like in real life, siblings have rivalries. And you get on with one of one of your other siblings slightly better than the other one. Um, it is slightly more cutthroat, um, I think. Probably think more succession uh, than British oh, tea boy. time. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, I think the Dragon Emperor, and certainly the Dragon Empress, who's a bit more active, uh, the mm -hmm. Dragon Emperor, I think he sleeps a lot. Uh, it's like the old tired patriarchs, oh, the kids. Uh, uh, but <laughs> the Dragon Empress is probably a bit more active, uh, you know, making sure everyone plays nice. Um, but I, 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 I can imagine, and certainly, and it, this goes on to a greater point, sorry if I'm rambling. Um, but oh, all yeah. the factions are designed and always have been since like Rick first put pen to paper that you could always justify why one faction would fall out with itself. You know, the Empire, all those warring states, orcs and goblins, obvious. Um, so, so Cafe, kind of the way it's been designed, falls into that. That there is completely conceivable that the Cafe dragons will at times get very fractious with each other and probably have a bit of a fight. I mean, we need not just the tabletop needs that. We need that too uh, in Total War. So you know, you, you want to be able to have these different factions of cafe falling out with each other, so you, so you can you know the clues in the title have Total War. It's almost like I it's thought, Warhammer. 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Quite a few questions to get through with only six minutes left. So we'll try and whiz through them. Um, question for all four. One word answers, please. Which one of the Chaos Gods do you pledge your soul to? Slanesh. Nurgle. Slanesh. Slanesh. Nurgle. Yeah. Oh, so three for Slanesh and one for Nurgle. It, there's a clear winner in this group. Um, is there we'll any get chance? you in the end. We'll get you in the end. You know that, don't you? <laughs> I, I, I tell that back, I, I've seen too many Hellraiser films. It's not as... It's not, as, it's as not all it's cut out to me. Yeah. The, the pain comes with the pleasure. So maybe, yeah. So, yeah, maybe just corn. I don't know. <laughs> um, well, Slanesh, Slanesh still wins there's two of us against you <laughs> <laughs> um, is there any chance we'll see Covid limitations elements related to um, Warhammer 3 production to be introduced at a later date I remember in one of the interviews some things had to be sacrificed due to Covid regulations like audio work and Toka Gaming remembers explicitly plague bearers not getting their counting chance and such because actors couldn't be staffed into one booth or things like that on the slab for the game what as in kind of trying to remedy those situations. Yeah, yeah I think so. Yeah. Um I, I think it, it's always there and we did a we did a kind of audio rework about a couple of years back um and kind of refreshed all the audio uh like with for instance with Jaws we, I added the line that's a grudging because everyone was saying it on the internet so we needed it in the game. Um is there a absolutely you know is there a piece of on on the schedule go and sort out play bearers no mm -hmm. um is but you know we're, we're here for the long haul like i said we've got a long roadmap and this game's going to be here for a while and and there will come a time when we'll start to look at refreshing the audio and and certainly i will be flagging that and going oh can we have play bearers start counting there please that would be great um, Baster34 asks, is there any plan to insert some more narrative focus optional endgame event like massive chaos invasion that conquers key cities, Nagash who tries to become more powerful, etc.? I think we have got endgame events uh, now for uh, Immortal Empires. So one of the designers, Craig, he, he really knocked it out of the park with his kind of endgame scenarios. Uh, and they're all very modular and variable as well, they're customizable. So they're certainly there. Um, as we move forward with DLCs, we'll be looking at how we deliver narrative in those DLCs. So, um, you know, the end game is always something that we're looking at to, to, to make stronger. Uh, it's always a bit hard in a strategy game because as you become more successful, you become the biggest fish in the pond. So that makes it harder to, you know, knock you down. It's just kind of almost the paradigm of strategy games. Um, but we're always trying to make sure there's longevity in your campaigns. And, and adding to that question, when can expect bigger villains as Nagash or Thankwall to join the mayhem? Uh, I, I've said it from the very start, and you know, even before for me, we, we want it all in. And my, the, irony, the biggest irony for me is my two favourite characters in Warhammer: Thankwall uh, and Kurt Helborg. Neither of them ah. are in the bloody game I make. <laughs> well, there was an earlier question about um the greatest moustache in Warhammer, and, Kurt and we all Helborg's know that it's Kurt Helborg. Name <laughs> was mentioned. Yeah. Um, right. So here's one. Poor Sir Raisin has been trying to get this question in, and a, a number of times, but we don't really have that much time, so we might not be able to give an answer. Um, lore wise, the 40k universe is probably even broader than Warhammer Fantasy, but can the gameplay loop be adapted to Total War? Do you reckon? Don't know. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> no. Well, there we go. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Two minutes left. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm focused on Total War Warhammer yep. at the moment. Yep. Um, Terran Ed, will any Age of Sigmar units reach Warhammer 3 like Brimstone Horrors because each and characters that were originally for Warhammer Fantasy but got cut due to end times like Short War the Executioner? Um, we have occasionally brought in some Age of Sigma units when it's been appropriate. Yeah. And when we've got away with it, like like the, the, the demon designs yep, uh, demons. And, and the, the Zentian, you know, disc knights. Mm -hmm. Um but as a as a as a general rule, Age of Sigma is a separate license um to, to mm -hmm. under the Warhammer Fantasy Battle license. But <clears throat> yeah, it's like the, 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 the demons so, are the crossover. Um, yeah, yeah, they, they are the universal constant, um, so right. to speak. Yeah, 
yeah. the only constant is change and, and demon. <laughs> yeah, love that. And some of those um, demons are about change. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's why I love it. <laughs> and one final question from Goat Screen. Who is the better father, the God Emperor or the Dragon Emperor? Not that they are particularly <laughs> great at <of> fatherhood. <laughs> Uh, ooh, uh, I, I'm gonna have to. Ooh, it's a difficult one, isn't it? Um, Dragon Emperor. Yeah, you know, I mean, I think the answer is always yeah, not the God Emperor. Kid, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, the answer is never the God Emperor. Not, not, the, guy, not the guy who who consumes ten thousand souls a day. To yeah, yeah. 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 That, that guy, guy, hell of a guy. <laughs> <laughs> They all want to impress him, but he's a bad boss. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, that brings us to the end of the stream. So um, thank you so much, Andy um, Hall, for joining us. That was uh, really, really good. We got through so many questions and I think um, loads from the chat, which was great to see. Um, join us next week as we talk to Steve D about what exactly, Andrew Law? Um, indeed, it's about how he's moved from working on Warhammer into working on his own company, his own games. Um, he's uh, currently got the score out on Kickstarter and he's quite keen to do talk about that too which is not a surprise Brilliant. very Excellent. much looking forward to it um and until then i'd like to say so um thank you so much to all our viewers everyone who contributed in the chat that was brilliant and of course our patrons who make this possible and our discord community please come join us there um till the next time i just want to say thank you again to andy hall to my fellow brooks awesome. and goodbye and as always Coco, coco. <laughs> <laughs> Good night. Bye. Bye bye.